Well, good evening. Oh, how'd you get the chair back? Did you get to try it? That's what I set it there for. Okay. All right, well, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful uh, for your goodness to us, for your provision to meet our needs. We continue to pray for those that are without power, that you would meet their needs as well, and that you would be with the crews that are out working to restore power. As, uh, I'm sure they've had several long days already, and we just pray for strength for them and that they would get the rest they need as well. We do pray as we meet together tonight that we'd honor and glorify you, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Had to start with that, right? Cough. Hymn number 58 to start. This is my father's world. I'm getting so I don't use cough drops most of the time anymore, but as soon as I try, try to sing, I'm in trouble. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round he brings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and of skies and seas, his and the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, and birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world, oh let me ne'er forget. That though the wrong seems off so strong, God is a ruler yet. This is my father's world, the battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and everyone. All right, we're in Exodus chapter 24 tonight. Uh, Ezekiel 24. I'm going to go with it starts with a with an E. One name starts with E. We can do charades, right? Ezekiel chapter 24. We are still in the judgment chapters of Ezekiel, uh, where God is declaring his judgment on Israel and Judah in particular. We're coming up soon where some of the other nations get judged, but we're still on Judah's judgment. And uh, Ezekiel 24 is a lesson on when we value the wrong things. Uh, Israel had lost focus on what mattered. They uh, had prioritized some wrong things in their lives. When they stopped valuing what God valued, they lost the ability to respond to what mattered. And uh, there's a very ugly picture in chapter 24. Not ugly as in parental guidance needed or anything like that, but just a very hard picture there. Uh, and the illustration for us is that when we harden our hearts towards God, our hearts harden towards what matters too. So we don't want to harden our hearts towards God. Genesis chapter 24, we start off with the seething pot. There's an illustration that God gives Ezekiel of a pot that's boiling over a fire. And the picture that's here in the first uh, several verses of Exodus 24 is a picture of judgment coming. Again, verse 1, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, write thee the, the name of 
of the day, even of this same day, the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem this same day. Now, God talks to Ezekiel and says, write down this date. Now, in our minds, there are some dates that stand out. For Ezekiel and for the people of, of Judah that were in captivity, the ninth year, tenth month, tenth day would stand out. Uh, for us, tenth month, tenth day, October 10th. Doesn't mean much to us, does it? Uh, down in Ecuador, the uh, big celebration took place on 10 de Agosto, August 10th. That was their Independence Day. But dates for us that stand out. What do you think? Any dates that stand out that you remember what the day means? Joseph thinking, if only I could remember when the 4th of July was. Oh, you know when the 4th of July is? It's in August, right? No, 4th of July. What other dates stand out in our minds? December 25th, right, when we celebrate Christmas. May 13th, your birthday. Different dates stand out for different reasons. How about December 7th? Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, September 11th. The what? The Twin Towers and the Pentagon and the field in Pennsylvania. So our dates that stand out in our minds that all we have to do is hear the date and we remember what it means. Well, the 10th day of the 10th month would be like that. God tells Ezekiel, write it down. This is the day that the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem. And here's the parable telling them that judgment was coming. Utter a parable under the, verse 3, under the rebellious house and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, set a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. Gather the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with the choice bones, take, up the, cho take the choice of the flock, and burn also the bones under it, and make it boil well, and let them seed the bones of it therein. And this pot, this cauldron, is going to be a picture of Jerusalem. And having everything in there, and having it boiled well and seething therein is a picture of the siege that's coming of Jerusalem. That they were going to be stuck in the city and they were going to be under attack and that would be the fire that was there was the attack of the Babylonian king. But then he continues on, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein. Not a very nice way for him to refer to the people of Jerusalem. To the pot whose scum is therein, and whose scum is not gone out of it, bring it out piece by piece, let no lot fall upon it. So if the pot is Jerusalem, and they're under siege, and the stuff in the pot are the people, and they bring all of the stuff out of the pot, they're talking about all the people being brought out of the city of Jerusalem. There was the siege, and then there was the exile. And we know it's talking about the judgment because verse 7 says, For her blood is in the midst of her. And Ezekiel has taught, talked many times about the bloody city and the guilt that was there. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust, that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered. Uh, so there's the the exile of Jerusalem. And then we come to verse 9. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, I will even make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty upon the coals thereof, that the brass of it may be hot and may burn, and that the filthiness of it may be molten in it, that the scum of it may be consumed." She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire, and thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged, and thou shalt be purged from thy filthiness any more till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. That people are exiled, and God's, city, God's fury resting upon his, the bloody city, and the purging and the burning of it is a picture of Jerusalem being destroyed. He says, write down this date. The siege began. Jerusalem is 
been exiled, the people, and then the city has been destroyed. And God says, for sure, verse 14, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. According to thy ways and according to thy doings, shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. That's all stuff we've heard before. God's people would be judged. They were due for judgment. Then we get to the ugly picture in Ezekiel 24. Verse 15, the word Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shalt thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of thine head upon, thy, upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet, cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. Ezekiel was commanded not to weep, not to mourn, not to show any sorrow as God took the desire of his eyes from him. And it says, with a stroke. Now, I read a commentary today that said, well, it's some people say Ezekiel's wife was sick for a very long time and he knew this was coming. And they said, we know that's not true because it says she died of a stroke. Oh, good. You caught that too. What's the stroke talking of? God's hand. There's a stroke. I guess like the word of the Lord goes out and it's accomplished. And, and I thought, she died of a stroke? They autopsy and find out there was a blood clot that, that, uh, that took her life. But God told the prophet Ezekiel that his wife would die. She would be taken from him. And he was not to mourn. He was not to, to cry. He was not to mourn for the dead. Uh, he was not to do the things, putting things off that you would normally put off. Uh, cover not thy lips and eat not the bread of men. He said, don't, don't do the things that you would normally do when you lost a loved one. And in verse 18, he says, I spoke to the people in the morning and at evening my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. He went about his business as if nothing had happened. That's a pretty ugly picture. It's a pretty ugly picture. <laughs> Who wants a job of a prophet? Isn't that a great job? Hey, Ezekiel, we need to teach the people of Judah something so your wife's going to die and uh, don't cry about it. Sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Hosea had some of that harshness attacked. Hey, your uh, wife left you and is playing the, the harlot again. Go back and bring her back. Prophets had to do a great many things and suffer a great many things. And in this case, Ezekiel was not to mourn the death of his wife. This is an illustration for Judah that Ezekiel had to live out. The illustration is stark. It's powerful because it's unnatural. It's powerful because it's completely wrong. If Ezekiel's wife had died, that wouldn't have drawn much attention to Ezekiel if he went out mourning like normal. But because he didn't mourn like normal, it brought a lot of attention and the people had to ask about it. Verse 19, the people said unto me, wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us that thou doest so? They saw in Ezekiel's action, not mourning the death of his wife, that something was wrong. And they said, what is the message for us? They recognized Ezekiel was a prophet. They recognized that the word of the Lord was coming through Ezekiel and he didn't say anything about it. So they said, what's the message? What are you trying to tell us? So here's the message, verse 20. Then I answered them, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary. Destruction of the temple is in view here. The excellency of your strength. Uh, which they would not have recognized that the temple was the excellency of their strength. The desire of your eyes and that which your soul pitieth and your sons and your daughters whom ye have left shall fall by the sword and ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. 
Your tires shall be upon your head and your shoes upon your feet. Ye shall not mourn nor weep, but ye shall pine away for your iniquities and mourn one toward another. Ezekiel said, here's the picture I just showed you. You aren't mourning over things that matter. I didn't mourn over something that mattered because God told me not to because the people of Israel were not mourning over what mattered. Israel would not mourn the losses that they faced. They would not mourn the destruction of the temple. Well, why would they? They're in Babylon. They weren't worried about the temple. They were out of, out of the, the nation. They didn't view the temple as the source of their strength. They didn't view the temple as the excellency of their strength. They didn't view the temple as the place where God dwelled with, dwelt with them, the picture of their strength, the picture of their glory. They wouldn't mourn it. goes on to say that they wouldn't mourn the loss of their sons and daughters. So, well, I can't picture that. Now, don't picture this as the sons and daughters of the people that he's talking to, but he's talking about the children of Israel. And there were going to be the loss of some of the children of Israel, and they wouldn't mourn it. I think of Hezekiah. I think it was Hezekiah who prayed for 50 or prayed for a lengthening of his life and he was given 15 more years. Now you got me doing it. I'm, all my Bible trivia is all off, but they'll keep me in line. And in those 15 years, he bragged about the wealth that he had and God told him judgment was coming, but it wouldn't be in his day. It would be in his son's day. And you remember Hezekiah's response? Well, that it isn't in my day, isn't it? You know, well, that's good. No bad will come to me. How could you respond that way? I guess, I guess cursed my son that will reign after me to suffer the attacks of, of Israel's enemies. And he says, well, at least it's not in my day. And that's what the people of Israel in captivity were doing. They were not going to mourn the loss of the people that were left behind. That didn't bother them. They had stopped worrying about and and prioritizing and valuing the things that mattered. What would they have valued over God's temple? What would they have valued over the loss of their fellow Israelites, their fellow Jews? Well, they valued their comfort. Because when Ezekiel was prophesying, there were other prophets saying, listen, nothing bad is happening yet. And that happened to a lot of the prophets. Judgment is coming, and other prophets would go, but we are at peace and comfortable because God is blessing us. No. And they had heard that message so many times that just like Hezekiah, they said, well, at least it's comfortable here. We're in captivity, but there's food on our table. We have homes. We have our families with us. We're okay. They were prioritizing their own comfort over God's word and honor. They, they valued their well-being over the well-being of their countrymen that were lost. So verse 24, thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. His not mourning for his wife was a sign. According to all that he hath done, shall ye do. You won't mourn important losses. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. And here's why that picture was given. Because the judgment God was bringing would give them opportunity to hear God's word again. Verse 25, And thou, son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take from them their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that he that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear it with thine ears. In that day shall thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped. And thou shalt speak, and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Like, wait a second, in that day Ezekiel will be able to speak again? He's been speaking all along about the judgment that was coming. He's been speaking all along that the people need to turn to, the, to God. But God's telling him, when that happens, when they don't mourn the important losses, when they don't mourn and these things come to pass and the judgment, they get news of the judgment that's happened, that judgment is going to give them an opportunity to hear God's message once again. 
It's going to give them an opportunity to value those things that are important again because they had forgotten and they had turned their back on it. When we value the, the wrong things, a correction needs to come. God's got ways of, of, of bringing it. But also when we value the wrong things, we do what Judah had done. They hardened their heart against God. And when they hardened their hearts against God, they lost that softness towards other things as well. Now you could say, well, there are people that have hard hearts towards God that are very sensitive people. Yep. There are. But when God's people harden their heart against God, their hearts get hard towards everything else. We need to make sure we keep our hearts soft towards God and value the things that are important. Value the things that God values. Value the things that matter to him. And mourn the things that are are uh, that mean something to God as well, the loss of things. Well, what means something to God? Well, human life does. We should always mourn the loss of human life. Things that matter to God, his honor, his glory, those matter to God. And we should always mourn when God is dishonored, uh, whether that takes place in our life or whether that takes place in our country or halfway around the world. We need to make sure we value the right things because when we value the wrong things, we lose that sensitivity that we need to have. Well, we will go offline for our time in praise and prayer tonight.